Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this video lecture is entitled Biblical Inerrancy. This video lecture is for the class Theology One at the East Asia School of Theology. One of the key doctrines of Christianity is the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. In a nutshell, this doctrine teaches that the Bible is without error. But how are we to understand biblical inerrancy? And how should we deal with those passages in the Bible that seem to cause problems for this doctrine? These are the questions that we'll be looking at in today's video lecture. Let's begin by talking about how to understand biblical inerrancy. There are several different positions with regard to biblical inerrancy. The first one that I want to mention is plenary inerrancy. There is, in plenary inerrancy, there is a dual divine human authorship of the Bible. The Holy Spirit superintended the writing so that it was God's word as well as the word of humans. The veracity of God demands the veracity of his word. Thus, there are no errors in the original document of any kind, including theological teaching, historical information, scientific data, geographical description, etc. So this is the position of plenary inerrancy. The next position I want to talk about is non-inerrancy. For those who advocate non-inerrancy, they argue that if a single case of genuine error can be pointed out in scripture, the, cause, the case of inerrancy falls. For them, inerrancy is like a, a stack of cards. You pull out one card and the entire stack falls down. Indeed, many opponents of the Bible pour much effort into finding errors in the Bible. So this is the position of non-inerrancy. Then there's the position of partial inerrancy. This position says that there are a few errors in the scripture, but these errors only pertain to incidental matters and things that are not central to the Christian faith and practice. Therefore, they, they hold that the Bible is without error in matters of faith and practice only. So that's the position of partial inerrancy. But the key question here is, does divine authorship ensure error-free composition by finite and sinful humans? That's the key question. And why is this doctrine so important? Well, inerrancy is so important because God's faithfulness and reliability are at stake. Also, it's important because our trust in the Bible as the authoritative word of God is at stake. And difficulties in, this, in understanding inerrancy are often stumbling blocks to non-believers and believers in their faith. So this is why this doctrine is so important. So let's look at some of these difficulties that we have <clears throat> in the doctrine of inerrancy. And so much of what follows is going to be apologetics, defending this doctrine. So the first major type of difficulty are scientific problems. And one key scientific problem is the date of creation. A straightforward reading of the Bible seems to suggest that Earth and the universe is not much more than 6,000 years old. Yet the geological record seems to suggest that Earth is at least 
four billion years old, and astronomical evidence seems to suggest that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. There are several ways one can respond to this apparent conflict between science and the Bible. The one, one could try to harmonize the Bible with current science by accepting the view that science has proven that Earth and the universe are old, that evolution did happen, and that evolution was the mean by which God created the universe, Earth, and all life on Earth, including humans. This position is known as theistic evolution, and a number of Christians hold to theistic evolution, including the late Tim Keller, N.T. Wright, Francis Collins, and John Stott. There are a number of problems with theistic evolution, both from a scientific standpoint and from a theological standpoint. Then there is the day-age theory. Another way Christians try to resolve apparent, the apparent conflict between the Bible and science is the day-age theory, with each day of creation representing thousands, millions, or even billions of years. This view is often based on 2 Peter 3, 8, which states, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. This view tries to find a middle ground between creation and evolution. Then there's the literary framework view. In this approach, the six days of creation are divided into two triads of three days each. In the first triad, day days one to three, God created the physical universe, including light, sky, water, land, and plants. In the second triad, days four to six, God then created the sun and moon to rule over the day and night, fish and birds to rule over the water and the sky, animals to rule over the land, and humans to rule over all of creation. The framework view does allow Christians who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible to resolve the apparent conflict between the creation account and evolution. It can, it can be used by both old earth creationists and young earth creationists. The framework view interprets the six days of creation figuratively, but in a way that takes the biblical text seriously. There is also the gap theory. According to the gap theory, there is a gap between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. During this gap, God destroyed creation then recreated the universe beginning in verse 2, an interval of indeterminate length, possibly billions of years, separates verses 1 and 2. One possible explanation for this ancient catastrophe is, is that the universe, or at least Earth, was destroyed when Satan fell to Earth following his rebellion against God. The gap theory allows one to be both an old earth creationist and a young earth creationist because the gap theory says there were two separate creation events separated by a great catastrophe. And then there's the young earth creation view. This is the traditional view in which God created the universe and our world in six 24-hour days some 6,000 years ago. Some young Earth creationists believe that Earth is as old as 10,000 years or even 15 to 20,000 years old. This view is based largely on a literal reading of Genesis 1 and 2. Young Earth creationists point out that the days of creation are numbered 
you have, for example, you have, it says the, the first day, the second day, et cetera. And they also point out that the phrase, and there was evening and morning accompanies each day. Together, these details seem to point to each day being a literal 24 hour day. <clears throat> So these are the different views that Christians have concerning creation. Now, the next um, major account that seems to pose scientific problems in the Bible is Noah's flood. There are questions, for example, about whether a global flood that covered the entire earth is possible. Some argue that the flood account in Genesis refers to a local or regional flood instead of a global flood. Others claim that there is no geological evidence of a global flood and argue that there isn't enough water on Earth to produce a global flood. Yet, according to scientists, there is a huge amount of water within Earth's mantle. It is estimated that there may be up to three times more water locked up inside Earth's mantle than on the surface. This agrees with Genesis 7:11, which says that on the day the great flood began, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. In addition, Almost every single culture has a flood story. Flood stories have been found among ancient Babylonians, Native Americans, Mayans, Aztecs, Inuits, Australian Aborigines, Romans, Greeks, Chinese, and many others. These stories also share similarities with the Genesis account, such as an angry God and people who survived in a boat. The flood stories strongly suggest there was a global flood that affected the entire world. In terms of scientific evidence for a global flood, consider the following. Sedimentation. This is a geological process in which matter is deposited on the surface out of a fluid. This happens primarily through flood. And get this, 70% of the Earth's land surface is covered by sedimentary structures. This strongly suggests that there was a worldwide flood. Then there are marine fossil remains. Abundant fossil remains have been found on the top of every mountain, major mountain range in the world including the Himalayas. This evidence fits in with Genesis 7:19, which tells us that all the high mountains under the entire heaven were covered. <clears throat> there are many questions about Noah's Ark as it is described in the Genesis account. Genesis account. For example, how did all the animals come to the ark from all over the world? How could Noah and his family fit two of every animal into the ark? How did Noah and his family have enough food to feed all the animals? How did Noah and his family manage all of the animal waste? And could Noah's ark actually be seaworthy enough to survive the great flood? <clears throat> Possible answers to these questions include the, answering the question, how could Noah and his family fit two of every animal into the ark? One possible solution is to note that the Hebrew word men means kind, which is a broader category than our modern day word species. Depending on how kind is classified, there could have been about 7,000 animals, far more manageable than literally hundreds of thousands or even millions 
of individual species. And could Noah's Ark actually be seaworthy enough to survive the great flood? Experts tell us that a wooden ship the size of the Ark would simply break apart under the stress of ocean wind and waves if it's not of the right design. Therefore, many cr critics argue that there is no way Noah's Ark could have been seaworthy enough to survive the Great Flood. <clears throat> well, it all depends on how the Ark was built. The Ark was most likely not a box. A simple box structure is not very seaworthy. It likely had curves to it, together with keels, because both of these features would make it far more seaworthy than a simple box. There are many other questions about Noah's Ark, but the vast majority of these are very speculative in nature and are best avoided. Then there is the Exodus. There appear to be many problems with the Exodus account. Egyptian historical records, which go back 5,000 years, contain no mention of the events of Exodus or a large slave population of Hebrews. Nor is there any evidence that a large number of people passed through the Sinai Peninsula on the way to Canaan. The Bible records 600,000 Israelite men. If we include wives and an average of two children per couple, there likely would have been two to two and a half million Israelites passing through Sinai. Yet, we find no evidence of any remains left behind, such as bones or graves. This lack of evidence has led many scholars and especially archaeologists to conclude that the events written in Exodus did not happen. There are a few possible explanations for this lack of evidence for the, for the Exodus in the his, Egyptian historical record. One is the events of Exodus never happened. Two is the events of Exodus happened, but they weren't considered important enough to be recorded by the Egyptians. And a third option is that the events of Exodus happened, but the Egyptian pharaohs didn't want to record such an embarrassing defeat. There is, however, what might be called circumstantial evidence that points to the Exodus being a real historical event. This evidence includes internal evidence. The book of Exodus in, contains word that have Egyptian origins. For example, in Exodus 2-3, we find a number of words with Egyptian origins, in Hebrew that is, including basket, bulrushes, pitch, reeds, and river. The inclusion of these words with Egyptian origins suggests that the Israelites did live in Egypt long enough for Egyptian words to enter the Hebrew language. Another bit of evidence is the Papyrus Brooklyn 35.1446. This is a papyrus discovered in Egypt, which lists the names of 95 household slaves, including some with Hebrew names. This papyrus dates to Egypt's 13th dynasty, circa 1809, to 1743 BC, which provides evidence that the Hebrews lived in Egypt before the events recorded in Exodus. There's also a mural of slaves making bricks. This mural, which was found in the tomb of an Egyptian official, shows slaves making bricks from mud. This mural confirms that brick making was one of the tasks slaves in Egypt did. There are also written Egyptian records of brick making, including mention of one district lacking straw for making bricks, which helps us to better understand the distress the Hebrew slaves 
would have felt when they were denied straw to make bricks. Then there are excavations at Avaris. Avaris is an earlier city that was found under the city of Ramesses. Avaris was originally settled in the 19th century BC by non-Egyptian from Canaan. This was the same time as Joseph's arrival in Egypt. Canaanite pottery and weapons have been found in Avaris. In addition, a prominent tomb was discovered in Avaris that includes the statue of a Semitic man with a multicolored robe, which could be a possible reference to Joseph. Exodus 1.11 tells us that the Hebrew slaves helped build the cities of Python and Ramesses, which were built not built until the time of Pharaoh Ramesses II, who lived from 1279 to 1213 BC. One suggestion is that Moses used the name Ramesses instead of Avaris because Ramesses was a more familiar name. There's also the Soleb inscription. This inscription was found at a temple in Soleb, Nubia, which, lied, which lists places that Amenhotep II claimed to have conquered, including a place listed as the land of the Shashu, Shasu, or nomad of Yahweh. This inscription indicates that Egypt's pharaohs knew of Yahweh by 1400 BC, which suggests that the exodus took place before 1400 BC. And then there is the Merneptah stele. This is a stele in Egypt that describes the victories of the Pharaoh Merneptah around 1230 BC over peoples in Libya and Palestine. One of the peoples mentioned is a people called Israel. This indicates that the Israelites were living in the promised land by this time. Then there's the question of the parting of the Red Sea. There is debate over the exact location of the Red Sea. The Septuagint identifies it as the Red Sea itself, while many argue that the Red Sea, Yam Suf in Hebrew, should be more accurately translated Sea of Reed. If this alternate translation is accurate, this means the parting of the Red Sea took place somewhere in the Nile Delta. It is, if that is the case, then it is unlikely that we will ever know the exact location because the Nile Delta has shifted significantly in the millennia since the events of Exodus. As to the question of what actually caused the Red Sea to part, Exodus 14.21 tells us that God used a strong east wind to drive back the water. There have been attempts to provide scientific explanations for this miracle. One theory is that a strong wind from the east created a storm surge in another part of Lake Tanis which is one of the lakes of the Nile Delta. And this storm surge completely cleared the water, thus uncovering the bottom of the Red Sea. Others speculate the parting of the Red Sea was caused by volcanic eruption on the island of Santorini in the Mediterranean Sea. This volcanic eruption resulted in a tsunami that hit the Nile Delta causing the water to first rush away from the shore and exposing dry land, then rushing back in to drown the Egyptian army. Regardless of which explanation is the best explanation, there is one aspect that points to divine providence, the timing of this event. Even if this event can be explained in a purely naturalistic way, how can we explain that this event occurred at a moment 
that was uniquely advantageous, if not life-saving, for the Hebrews. There is also uh, the account of Jonah and the big fish. For many years, skeptics argued that it is not possible for any human to survive being eaten alive by a large fish, let alone survive for three whole days inside a fish. Many have pointed out problems with such a scenario, including the lack of oxygen and the presence of poisonous gases while inside a whale for a prolonged period of time. However, there are a number of facts we can say about this miracle. Number one, Jonah was a historical person. He is mentioned in 2 Kings 1425. Number two, Nineveh was a real city that was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The present day city of Mosul in Iraq sits just across the river from where Nineveh was located. Number three, there are real sea creatures that are large enough to swallow an entire person whole including whales and the great white shark. And number four, Jesus referred to Jonah as a real man and spoke of his being swallowed by a great fish as a real historical event. If we are to dismiss Jonah's time in the big fish as fictional, then we would have to say that Jesus was a liar. <clears throat> And then there's this. In June 2021, off Cape Cod, lobster diver Michael Packard was swallowed alive by a humpback whale. Mr. Packard remained inside the whale for only 30 to 40 seconds before the whale spat him out, but he was swallowed whole by a whale and lived to tell the tale. Numerous news reports confirmed this incident did happen, including this photograph of Michael Packard in Cape Cod Hospital, where he was taken after the incident. While we have to accept Jonah's time inside the big fish as an act of faith, we can, as when talking about miracles in general, attempt to show skeptics why believing such a miracle is a reasonable conclusion. In the end, we must still remember that only God can truly convince anyone of the truth of his word. Let's talk about Jesus's miracles. Jesus's miracles were prominent in the gospels, yet many skeptics have problems with Jesus's miracles. As mentioned earlier, Many deny Jesus' miracles because of their naturalist worldviews. That is, they believe this physical world is all that exists. So by definition, miracles can't exist. Yet the Gospels are full of miracles performed by Jesus. He performed many healings, restoring sight to the blind, he healing the deaf, making paralytics walk again, cleansing lepers of leprosy, healing those with high fevers, healing a woman who suffered from bleeding for 12 years, restoring a man's severed ear, and restoring a man's withered hand. There were also miracles that didn't involve healing, calming the storm, feeding 5,000 men, then 4,000 men, plus women and children, by multiplying small amounts of food, turning water into wine, twice producing a miraculous catch of fish, walking on water, causing a fig tree to wither, and casting out demons. <clears throat> and then there's the greatest miracle of all. Jesus himself rose from the dead. The Bible also records that Jesus was born of a virgin, as well as Jesus' visible ascension into heaven. 
When responding to these miracles, skeptics often take one of several approaches. First, they can flat out deny that any miracles occurred, since by definition, miracles cannot possibly occur in a world that is only physical in nature. Second, they claim that fakery was involved in these miracles. For example, those who were healed only pretended to be sick, or that wine was secretly substituted for water. Third, they argue that the miracle accounts in the Gospels are merely myths that have corrupted the historical record. And fourth, they offer rational explanations to de-spiritualize these miracles. For example, misty water on the Sea of Galilee made it seem that Jesus was walking on water, or the generosity of the boy who gave away his food inspired others to do the same. Skeptics use these same approaches to deny the resurrection. Many deny that Jesus even rose from the dead. The Quran teaches that someone who appeared to be like Jesus, who, who appeared to look like Jesus, died in his place. Some argue that Jesus' resurrection is merely a myth and often point to resurrection stories in other religions to support this argument. And some try to offer rational explanations to explain away the resurrection, such as claiming that Jesus simply fell into a deep slumber and then woke up on the third day. As with all other supernatural aspects of the biblical account, we cannot offer irrefutable evidence that Jesus' miracles took place. There is no smoking gun that proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that these miracles are real. So we have to accept, <clears throat> so we have to accept what the Bible says on faith. That is, we trust that the Bible is reliable and is therefore telling the truth. Yet we can give people good reason for taking this leap of faith. One argument that I find especially helpful for my own understanding is to consider the fact that Jesus' disciples spent three whole years with him. If anyone knew whether Jesus actually performed the miracles recorded in the Gospels or whether Jesus really rose from the dead, it would be his disciples. And what is the testimony of Jesus' disciples? Their testimony was that everything Jesus said and did was 100% true, and they sealed their testimony with their blood. Almost every one of the 12 disciples died as martyrs. With these men, who knew whether Jesus really did perform these miracles and who knew whether Jesus really did rise from the dead have died for something they knew was false. It's unlikely they would. And even if they did knowingly die for a lie, one would have to ask, what would be their motivation for doing so? Another argument against the reliability of the Bible is that the Bible is full of contradictions. Many people argue that parallel accounts in the Bible contain contradictory descriptions that invalidate the reliability of the Bible. These parallel accounts are two or more passages in the Bible that describe the same event but contain different details. For example, Genesis 1 and 2 have two different accounts of creation that appear to contradict each other. There are also the first three Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, which are known as the Synoptic Gospels because all three of them contain many of the same events from Jesus' life and ministry. Skeptics have identified a number of events 
they claim are, were, are described in contradictory ways between these three gospels as well as between all four gospels. For example, in Matthew, Bethlehem is Mary and Joseph's hometown, while in Luke, Nazareth is, their, is identified as their hometown. Luke 1 says that Jesus' birth took place during the reign of King Herod, whereas Luke 2.2 2 reports that Jesus was born during the census of Quirinius, the governor of Syria, which took place more than 10 years after King Herod died. The genealogies of Matthew and Luke disagree on who Joseph's father was. That is, Joseph, Jesus' foster father. In Mark 8, 12, Jesus says that no sign will be given to this generation. In Matthew 12, 39, Jesus says that only one sign would be given to given, that is the sign of Jonah. And John records seven signs that were given so that people might believe in Jesus. And all four Gospels have different post-resurrection accounts or details. How can we respond to these claims? One thing to remember is that the Gospels were written by four different men who had access to different sources of information. So yes, the Gospels do contain different details. However, when these details are examined closely, they combine to form a more complete picture of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. The different accounts of the four Gospels are much like what one would expect from different witnesses to a traffic accident. If four different witnesses see a traffic accident at an intersection, one from each one from a different corner, each person will see different details because each person sees the accident from a different perspective. One person will see some details that the other persons won't, and the same is true for the other witnesses. We should expect differences in details recalled by the witnesses. For example, one person may recall that one car was black, while the other witnesses recall it being gray, and so forth. In fact, in court trials, when every single witness gives testimony that is exactly the same in every detail, even including the exact same phrases, their testimony is usually viewed as being highly suspect and will often be thrown out since the witnesses likely colluded with one another. Given how imperfect our memories are, we should expect differences in testimonies between different witnesses. Now, some, wit some skeptics argue that the Bible is unreliable because of errors that have crept into the text over hundreds, even thousands of years of copying manuscripts. This objection is based on the assumption that human copyists are prone to error, and therefore the original manuscript has become corrupted by errors made during the process of copying the Bible. A common analogy used to support this argument is the analogy of the telephone game, in which one person whispers a message to another person until the last person receives the message upon which great hilarity results when the final message is compared with the original message. The Dead Sea Scrolls offers powerful evidence against such claims. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest known copy of the Old Testament dated from AD 1008. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written one, more than a thousand years earlier in the second century BC. When scholars compared the Dead Sea Scrolls with Old Testament copies from AD 1008, they found minimal differences between them. 
which testifies to the accuracy of the of transmission of biblical text through time. So let's discuss how to deal with difficulties. First, we, we need to talk about at attitude. We should make sure that we have the right attitude. Many skeptics mock belief in the Bible and the accounts of the Bible in a very satirical manner, called, accusing us of being irrational, outdated, opposed to progress, and even stupid. Sadly, some Christians respond to mockery with snarky and mocking comments of their own. An attitude of mockery will only harden skeptics in their unbelief. Instead, we need to be kind in all our interactions with skeptics. We should also be serious about their concerns. While some skeptics may offer argument simply to mock Christians, others have real questions and are genuinely searching for answers. We should always treat others with respect by taking their questions and concerns seriously, even if they are not serious. We should not dismiss their questions and should take time and effort to respond to their questions and concerns. Of course, we want to be good stewards of our time, and we may need to avoid answering insincere questions, but this requires discernment. We should also show love, patience, and a willingness to help. If skeptics ask a question we're unable to answer, we can acknowledge the difficulty of their question, offer to find the answer, and follow through by researching the question and giving them the answer once we've found it. We should be willing to clarify any confusion a skeptic may have. Sometimes a skeptic may be confused about some point because he or she has a simple misunderstanding. Clarifying and correcting misunderstanding can help clear away some of the metaphorical underbrush that might prevent a person from better understanding the truth. We also need to realize that of the objection that the skeptics have may stem from other issues. Sometimes skeptics may have other issues that lie behind their questions. These issues are often of a very personal nature. If and when emotional issues come to the surface, we should respond in a way that expresses a willingness to try to understand and a concern for the other person's well-being. Our own attitude towards scriptures is also important. Be persuaded in your own mind that an adequate explanation exists. There is no need to panic when you encounter a problematic passage in the Bible. You're not the first person to encounter this difficult passage. Others have wrestled with this passage and have found good solutions. Be confident that there are good solutions that will resolve the apparent difficulty. Treat scriptures with respect, trust, and obedience while you wait for the Lord to show you the solution. It may take time to resolve certain apparent contradictions, but the Lord is faithful and has promised that his spirit will guide you into all truth. When you examine a specific problem that seems to arise from the Bible, you can follow these steps as you see clarity. First, carefully study the context of the problem. Compare scripture with scripture, especially those that directly relate to the issue. Oftentimes, the best way to, let, to interpret scripture is to let another passage help you to understand the passage in question. Second, your interpretation should be based on sound exegesis. 
This means that you try to draw out the meaning of the text rather than reading your own meaning into the text. As much as possible, we need to allow the Bible to interpret our experiences rather than letting our experiences interpret the Bible. Third, in parallel passages, seek harmonization. Sometimes the differences are very minor, and even when there are significant differences, careful examination of the context will help us to harmonize parallel passages. You should also consult commentaries and other books which are specifically intended to deal with these kinds of issues. These books include the Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties by Gleason L. Archer, or the book When Critics Ask by Norman Geisler and Thomas Howe. Remember that some problems come from minor copyist errors, things like numbers and wording. Experts can help in these cases. In seeking harmony with ancient history, remember these things. Not all truth has been recorded or discovered. Not all ancient history is completely accurate. Sometimes ancient historians either got their facts wrong or they deliberately misrepresented certain events for various reasons. And remember that the Bible has consistently stood the test of time. Be aware that objections that are based on often unspoken anti-supernatural presuppositions or, and biases. Many skeptics believe this physical world is all that exists, and therefore, by definition, miracles cannot be real. Be aware, beware of objections by those who are not honest truth seekers, but who seek to mask unbelief in intellectual shrouds, which often cover up less compelling and more emotional or even immoral reason for rejecting the Bible. And be patient as you search and wait for an answer. Once again, trust in God's promise that his spirit will guide us into all truth. And that brings us to the end of this video lecture. I look forward to seeing you in class and discussing more about this issue.